Okay, so uh, moving along in Rudolf Steiner's Egyptian Myths and Mysteries. Uh, now we're at Lecture 8, and Steiner continues with his uh, sort of creation myth. And what he's doing, if you haven't already figured this out, is to try and relate the phases of evolution um, as we understand it in the scientific narrative, which he's inherited in which uh, we've got this idea that everything begins with water and that we have evolved from fishes that have transformed into amphibians that have eventually transformed uh, along the way into human beings. And he wants to relate this to his esoteric creation myth, which goes through all of his various phase, phases from uh, Saturn to Sun to Moon to Earth and then on Earth from the Lemurian to the Atlantean. And uh, to relate it also, though, what he does is he's tying all this together to what is known as the astrological man. Uh, and you can look this up online that shows how the astrological signs correspond to various parts of the body, starting with the feet at the bottom and the bottom of the zodiac, as it were, with Pisces. And the two Pisces fish correspond to the feet uh, as we're going up this ladder, um, which might be worth reviewing just for a second. Since this is, in a way, kind of a Western version of Kundalini, uh, as you go up, and this you can pull up, it's a little bit like uh, Leonardo's Vitruvian Man diagram, except with the astrological signs surrounding it and their correlations with the physical body. Uh, so the two Pisces fishes on this diagram correspond to the feet, whereas uh, Aquarius corresponds to the, uh, the calves, and uh, Capricorn corresponds to the knees, whereas Scorpio then corresponds to the genitals. Um, with uh, Sagittarius, of course, below that, rather, Sag Sagittarius corresponding to the thighs, then Scorpio corresponding to the genitals, and then uh, the, um, the hips are, of course, to Libra, the, the scales, and then up above that we have Virgo corresponding to the level of what would be called the Manipura chakra in the Kundalini, which has to do with the, the, the intestinal sort of area, and then... Uh, Leo for the heart and then Cancer for the stomach uh, and then the two twins, the Gemini to the two arms and then eventually with uh, Taurus to the larynx and Aries to uh, the point between the eyes which corresponds perfectly to the Agya chakra. Um, so those are the correspondences of the astrological signs to the various parts of the body and Steiner's using this as a kind of template to try and uh, slot the phases of his creation myth into correspondences with these parts of the body. He has the physical form beginning as purely etheric before the sun withdraws from the earth as purely etheric as these light filled chalice shaped beings with these corolla shaped etheric petals that are open to the sun flitting around like fireflies. Um, and then gradually the model moves uh, sort of from the lower parts that gradually he says become physically perceptible in the form of animals that human beings as they evolve from the spiritual into the physical world, slowly cast off these animal forms as he goes up the, let's say the Kundalini, up the ladder of the zodiac and up the ladder of evolution, casting off these forms. And more and more of his physical body becomes physically perceptible and visible, but as cast off animal forms, while the etheric, which is invisible, of course, to the physical senses, slowly withdraws and becomes physicalized and condensified into our present form. So that's the sort of arrow, the telos, the goal, the, traject the trajectory that he's taking here. And he says that during the sun phase, um, as the sun is withdrawing from the earth, man, as we have seen, had already developed to the point of a fish. This is the fish level. And prior to the withdrawal of the sun, the Christ being had been together with the earth moon system. So it's a single body. Uh, and the Christ being had been there and man had been able to commune with this Christ being. And then as the sun withdraws, the Christ being goes with it. Uh, and withdraws from the earth and man would have been at the level of a fish at that point and of course this would have taken place during uh, an ancient ancient version of the magnus Annus, in which the procession would have been in the sign of the fish pisces and then later when the christ being returns to the earth during the uh, fourth post-atlantean epoch the greco-latin epoch and the christ being incarnates in physical form comes down from the sun and reunites once again with the earth Again, we are in the age of Pisces when this takes place, the fish symbolism. Man felt himself a dim vestigial memory of the day when he had evolved to the level of, of a fish and the sun had withdrawn with the Christ being. Um, so he's at the level of, of a fish, at least in the lower part of his body, 
Other animal germs have evolved to the level of fish too. Uh, they've stayed where they're at. And then the evolutionary process then moved up to the Aquarian uh, calves uh, in which the Aquarian man is slowly condensifying more of the physical bodies becoming visible. And then the knees for Capricorn, which he had said in the previous chapter, corresponds to some sort of centaur-like being, which is sort of, or amphibian-like being, which is half uh, animal, half fish. And he says uh, that this would have taken place during the time of the moon's withdrawal when um, um, the islands had begun to solidify and the human being had moved up more or less to the level of where amphibians are today. Um, and then he says this corresponds not only to Scorpio with the sex drive, the Scor Scorpio was associated with the genitals in this ancient diagram, but also to the phase of Libra, which corresponds to the hips, which is a little bit puzzling until we realize that the amphibian form, of course, uh, requires a morphological structural transformation, and it has to happen. This is the mystery. If we look at our evolutionary models, this is the mystery because the, the mutation from lobe-finned lungfish, which have which do have longer fins, they're out like on stalks that can sort of flap around with fins, but the skeleton is fish-like, and then you get a jump to these creatures called ichthyostega, or also known as acanthostega. There are two different early species of amphibian, where the whole skeleton has to be morphologically rethought, and indeed the hips do have to be completely restructured so that they go outward and produce legs that can push up and lift the amphibian's body up away from the ground. Uh, and the front legs too, but the hips are involved in this process as well, and it's a complete mutation that has to take place in one generation. You can't have this transitional form flapping around in the dirt trying to find its way. It doesn't work that way, so there has to be a complete morphological transformation of both of the pelvis as well as the forelimbs. And so this corresponds, I think, loosely to Steiner saying that these are amphibial forms uh, that the human being cast off and moved on beyond. And then he says that at some point we were like more like snakes, uh, which as far as I can tell doesn't correspond to any of these signs. But he says these, these are awful forms and there's a, a, re, a reason why we feel uh, abhorrence at the sight of amphibians and snakes, but not when it comes to fish. We like to see fish floating around, swimming around in the waters. It gives us a sense of well-being, whereas these other forms uh, repel us because this is an age when we pass through these forms, the fish form, the amphibian form, the snake form, which correspond uh, on our geological time charts with the first fish appearing in the Cambrian about 575 million years ago and then with uh, amphibians appearing uh, about 300 to 400 million years ago. Somewhere in there, at the end of the Devonian epoch, we get the first amphibians, Ichthyostega and Acanthostega. And then near the end of the Carboniferous epoch, which is about 300 million years ago, we get the first snakes coming in. So we're moving up the ladder in, in terms of both the Darwinian narrative that we have inherited and uh, Steiner's evolutionary model, as well as this Western version of the Kundalini, whereby the signs of the zodiac are linked to the parts of the human anatomy. And so he says that, uh, so then the moon pulls out, and now we have the lower half of the human being is, has become visible in these animal forms. And now there is the process of the extraction of the properly human element from these lower animal halves, or these lower animal parts, which, would have, which concerns the upper six months of the signs of the zodiac. Um, Aries, Taurus, Gemini with the arms, and then those are the, the, the uppermost, and then uh, Cancer with the stomach, Leo with the heart, and then Virgo with the intestines. So he, he says that what needs to happen then is that the horizontal axis of the spine, the animal axis, has to be made vertical. So the process of transformation is what you might call the raising of the jet pillar, where Osiris, as we saw, had withdrawn with the moon, Osiris and Isis, uh, in the previous lecture, and where Osiris is associated with the moon forces of the first half of, of the moon, from new moon to full moon, and Isis with the second half from full moon to new moon, and that these forces uh, are linked with the 28 pairs of filaments of the spinal column. And indeed, as I pointed out, Osiris was correlated by the Egyptians with the raising of, the, of, of Osiris from a horizontal to a vertical position. When he's dead, he's in the horizontal position, when he's resurrected, he sits on his throne in the underworld in a vertical position. And this was symbolized in the so-called raising of the Jed Pillar ceremony, 
which Steiner now says is the extraction of the human from the animal. He starts talking about Virgo now. Virgo's in the level of the intestines, but he starts talking about Virgo as this idea of a, of a kind of virgin birth. Virgo is the virgin birth myth. Virgo is a virgin. And of course, uh, the virgin birth does not refer to a biological problem. It's not a biological fact. It refers to a spiritual birth. You are born of a virgin when the spiritual man, the second birth, not the birth of the physical body, but the birth of the spiritual man is extracted from the biological man. Or here in Steiner's case, the properly human being is extracted from all these weird animal forms that have preceded it in his model. And so then this moves into the problem of the his typology. He says, so then what happens later on in evolution is that we get these four different human types, which we've already seen him connect to the so-called tetramorph of the lion and the bull and the eagle and the man, which are linked later to the four evangelists. And they are, of course, part of the four um, fixed signs of the zodiac. And he says that these correspond to human types, whereby uh, in each of these types that would then appear during this early Atlantean age, each one would correspond to one or another aspect of the subtle body. The physical man, uh, which has been worked out here already in these animal forms, would be uh, bull men, the type in whom the physical predominates the most, whereas the spiritual man uh, is the eagle, the one who's lifted away from the earth in which the astral element, the astral body predominates the most. Whereas the ether those in whom the etheric body predominate the most are the lion, Leo. Now we're at the level of the heart where Leo is and the larynx where Taurus, Taurus is. So we're rising up. And then uh, the human being, those in which the ego predominated the most would then correspond to the man, which would be Aquarius, the water bearer. But we've already we've already gone past uh, the, the calves uh, and gone up higher. So he deals with uh, Leo and Taurus here. Uh, but not so much the eagle and the man, but nonetheless, we have these four basic human types in the early Atlantean period in which the human falls out into these four groups, even though the physical body hasn't completely solidified in the Atlantean period and doesn't do so into its present form until the end of the Atlantean period, where, whereby he says, individuals then begin the process of incarnating, incarnating as either male or female. And uh, so now we're at the level of Osiris and Isis working on the spinal column in the etheric body and those individuals in whom the etheric body is female, Isis, as we have seen, incarnate as male, those in whom uh, the etheric body is male, Osiris, incarnate as females, which uh, is a forerunner of the Jungian contrasexual theory of anima and animus. Jung also has a lecture on Kundalini that he gave later in his life where he understands the Kundalini as referring to almost Gebserian stages of consciousness, where I remember him tying uh, the Kundalini at the Manipura, at the level of the viscera, the intestines, to the magical consciousness structure, which Gebser does do, and the level of the heart, where the soul was thought to be localized in the heart by the ancients, with the mythical consciousness structure, and then the movement upward into the Agya Chakra and the Sahasrara is the movement up into our modern day understanding of consciousness at the level of the head, we think the soul is in the brain now, uh, just as the ancients thought that it was in the heart, just as for tribal man, it's in the viscera, hence horoscopy and the reading of the viscera that took place in ancient Babylon and so forth. And so he has this process of this gradual evolutionary process whereby, and then he brings in the myth of Isis and he says, remember how I said that uh, Isis with the Horus child on her lap um, was common between Egypt and our civilization but behind that was Isis with the wings of a vulture. Uh, and then there was an intermediary uh, image in between her in which she has the head of a lion. Now, I don't remember Isis ever having the head of a lion, uh, but there is a myth in which uh, Hathor, the cow goddess of the sky, does appear as the lion-headed Sekhmet, who in an apocalyptic, apocalyptic myth decides to wipe out all human beings in a sea of blood. But Isis did inherit the headgear of Hathor, the two cow's horns. So we do see Isis with the cow's horns. Um, and this is him connecting the whole process with these signs of the eagle and Leo and so forth. So we get the differentiation into the sexes uh, and the splitting off with the rise of the Osirian and Isis forces as the raising of the Jed pillar goes on with Steiner here and his linkage between his creation myth, the Darwinian creation myth, and this ancient zodiacal model that links the astrological signs to various aspects of the human anatomy. It's a tour de force here, and it's a lot of fun if you know how to read Steiner. Sometimes these are, after all, recorded lectures. They're oral uh, lectures. 
And so maybe sometimes the stenographer doesn't hear him right and forgets a detail or so forth. So the, the, it's not as clean and lucid and clear and well-written as Outline of Esoteric Science, but that's because Steiner wrote that book himself. These are taken down by stenographers. So sometimes you have to sift out the wheat from the chaff and figure out exactly what it is Steiner's trying to say, uh, because sometimes it comes across as sloppier than I know Steiner would, would ever be. And so that's uh, chapter eight in Egyptian Myths and Mysteries.